Good morning or afternoon coaches and thank you for tuning in to today's NSCA Hangout. I'm Monique Bowman and I'll be moderating today's conversation discussing coaching principles. Uh, with us today is Ian Barker, NSCA Director of Coaching Education, as well as Shellis Heinemann, NSCA Director of Coaching Emeritus, sorry, and former MLS coach. Um, our conversation today will discuss some of the important points of soccer coaching, um, and we'll also touch on uh, their respective presentations at the um, NSCA Summer Symposium, which kicks off next week. So if you have questions uh, during today's conversation, feel free to tweet them to us using the NSCAASYM hashtag. So uh, jumping into today's conversation, um, and Ian, we'll start with you um, with this question. Uh, some of the viewers um, know you, but may not know your background, and same with um, Shellis as well. Um, if you both could give us a, a quick rundown of your um, background and how you ended up in, to this point in your career. Sure. Um, well, I took a coaching badge. The first coaching badge I ever took was in Great Britain when I was a college student. But since then, um, having come over in 1987, I've only ever coached um, full-time in, in the U.S. Um, my background is 21 years of college coaching at the NCAA Division uh, One and Three levels. Um, I also work extensively with Olympic development, and I was also the state director of coaching for Minnesota Youth Soccer for 10 years. And so throughout my career, I've been uh, intimately involved in coach education, and the last two and a half years, I stepped away from college to work full-time in coach education within SCAA. And interestingly, um, Shellis's autograph is on one of my coaching <coughs> so uh, things. <coughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Shellis. Well, thank you, Ian. <laughs> um, it's great to be here, first of all. My, my background is really quite simple. I came to the United States when I was a young boy. Um, my first introduction to soccer was with a, a club in Dayton, Ohio called Dayton Adawise, where uh, they were older, older men. My cousin, Pat Souza brought me into the club at 15. And uh, I, I had, had a passion for the game. I uh, went to Eastern Illinois University on a soccer scholarship. The team did very well. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life, but I ended up uh, uh, going to Murray State and getting a graduate assistantship. And the part of my re responsibilities was to coach the club team. They were partly uh, varsity status, partly not varsity status. It, those were the old days. And I really enjoyed it. Um, played professionally for Cincinnati Comets, and then did a, in a, what they call an estagio in Brazil, which is uh, a year and a half program of just um, staying with a professional team. I was fortunate to be with Sao Paulo Futebol Club, and then um, went back to my alma mater and coached at Eastern Illinois for seven years, coached at Southern Methodist University for 24 years, and six years with uh, FC Dallas. So presently, I'm the consultant with FC Dallas, no longer the head coach. Um, and Shellis, do you have a autograph of E? Um, Shellis, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Let's go into our. Okay, looks like we're having some issues. So, Ian, I'll go back to you, and hopefully the um, internet connection will uh, 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 yeah, What are some universal truths um, that all soccer coaches should know? Well, um, in terms of the symposium, one of the themes we're working with is the principles of play. And it's born out of a webinar series we previously did, which was one of our very most popular, which was uh, attacking principles and defending principles of play. And I think Shellis may agree with me on this one. Having just completed a summer of coaching education, um, a lot of our coaches, uh, because of the amazing amount of media and opportunity they have to see the game, read about the game, certainly watch the game in the case of the World Cup, um, have begun to talk around the subjects a little bit more. And some of the coaching that we're working on hasn't been as precise as perhaps uh, we would like to see. So. The thing about the principles of play, um, as we understand them in America and are actually understood in pretty much everywhere in the world, are, are fairly straightforward um, and they don't change. And so we're going to, at the symposium, revisit the principles of play 
as the absolute cornerstone and building block of everything we do when we're working with players. Um, and that can be any style or system of play, any formation of play, but the principles are sort of immutable. And that's what we're going to look at at the, uh, at the summer symposium, or at least for a large part of the summer symposium. Okay. Charles, do we have you back? Uh, yes, yes. I'm have... here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you heard the question, so I'll repeat it. Um, in your experiences, in your opinion, what are some universal truths no. that all coaches should know? Well, first of all, I, I do agree with uh, Ian. The principles of play is, is really our foundation, and um, it is the cornerstone <clears throat> of players and coaches, and it never changes. The game is always changing, and uh, there's new tactics, there's new formations, and every World Cup and every Euros will bring those forward to us. And, and if, we, if we look back at Spain winning the previous World Cup, you would say, wow, everybody in the world would want to play like Spain. And now with Germany winning the most recent World Cup, you're, you're, well, I'm sure we're going to have a lot, of, a lot of coaches out there that want to play like Germany. But uh, the, the, the secret to it all is, is obviously having a good philosophy of how you want to play, and the principles of the games will give you that philosophy. You know, the best team doesn't always win, and this is what's so great about our sport. And it's probably the most difficult sport to predict who the winner is going to be because goals are harder and harder to score. Uh, there's tactics now involved in counterattacks, transition plays, set pieces that sometimes the best teams find themselves losing. I think you see uh, at the World Cup how many, how many teams that were expected to do well did not do well. And then the teams that surprise us, like, like uh, 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 Costa Rica and uh, uh, Colombia, teams that uh, you don't see traditionally uh, a strength in the world are doing so well. But no matter how, how it's done, it always comes back to the principles of the game, the attacking phase and the defending phase. Okay. Um, so, Shella, since you mentioned um, defending, um, when te teaching defending principles, what are some of the first concepts uh, coaches make point of? Well, I, th I think uh, you'll see this at the summer symposium uh, uh, quite often, is you want your team to be able to pressure the ball. And, and you, by pressuring the ball, you're stopping the penetration of the opposition. So uh, when you think about the principle of pressure, it really starts for simple to complex. And if, if you talk to a team as a group of players, we're going to pressure the ball, you really have to work with the individual player. And the individual player then not, not only pressures the ball, but comes in with the right speed, comes in and, and shepherds or directs the opponents in a different direction, a direction that we are statistically, or, or I'm sorry, tactically waiting for. And then you need support. And that's another principle. You need you have support from other teammates that are on the right angles and then the distance of helping. Um, and then... Another principle that, that we look at is balance, and, and this is when the oppositions are trying to get the ball wide, and they're trying to play on the flanks, and they're trying to change the point of attack. For you to pressure the ball and to have the support around the ball, you still must have players that have the ability to have balance so they don't beat you on one diagonal ball, and then, and then compactness where you're close to each other, and you can help each other out. Uh, if, if you do get beat or to, for the encouragement of shutting down the space. And of course, you, you want players to be uh, composed and not, and not just jump in for tackles. So those are the defending principles that I look at and, and that looked at throughout the world. Uh, Ian, did you have anything to um, add to that by chance? Or? No, I think Shellis pretty much got them all uh, in the correct order with the uh, with the uh, appropriate amount of uh, correct information. Okay. He would he would pass an NSCA diploma right now. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So um, Shellis mentioned earlier that the principles is you know essentially where you start. Um, so with that, you know, moving um, you know up and kind of developing your own coaching style. 
how do you do that with once you kind of master those principles? Ian, I'll start with you with that question. Well, <clears throat> much like we teach players, I think it's critical that uh, coaches f uh, find their feet in the game in small-sided environments. So um, to fully understand and appreciate the nuance of the principles of play, um, it's a lot, uh, a lot easier to do if you're coaching 2v2s, 3v3s, 4v3s, 3v4s, whatever, um, in smaller group dynamics. Because as the coach, you see more examples of the principles um, so you see greater frequency, and consequently you're able to to um, learn a little bit sharper, and you're also able to see it in a slightly smaller scale. And this is exactly how the players take the game on board as well. So when we build our principles in the case of attacking from penetration to support to width, mobility, and improvisation, um, we're not going to go straight into an 11 v 11. And so in our coaching curriculum, um, as with coaching curriculums for coaching education all around the world, we don't throw the coaches straight into the 11 versus 11 model with uh, older teenage or young adult players. We bring them back into small-sided activities. And this is by far and away the best way for a coach to, to begin uh, their learning and begin their understanding. Uh, Shalis, uh, same question. Uh, once you master those principles, um, how do you start developing your own coaching style from there? Well, I think Ian made a, made a great example about taking smaller numbers and painting a good picture. Uh, it's the picture that the coach wants the players to see and, and repetition of, of doing things over and over again with the correct information from the coach, whether on the defensive side of how to pressure a ball and how to f force the opponent to the sidelines if that's the direction you want them to go. I think it it's, works extremely well if you do it in smaller numbers. So you may start start off with a grid, and then you can have a counterattack goal. Then you can have two goals, and then you can start to add numbers and, and get and get the real game on the field. Um, you know, the one thing we do as coaches is is we have to understand that the game is the best teacher. So the players got to play. They have to play, and they have to they have to understand what they're doing. Uh, it was said a long time ago: uh, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And I think what we can do as coaches is, is we continue to develop players and to, to get them to places that they can't get to by themselves is, is we can then give them the information that we have and try to translate it to them so that they can carry the job on in the game and on the field. Uh, the one thing that, that we all recognize is we can be as prepared as we can for a game, but the players take it over once the whistle blows and they have to be able to follow the steps of what the coach is, is asking for. So um, you all, you both have worked your way to essentially being teachers of the game to other coaches. Um, how important has um, coaching education uh, played a role in your development in yourself, and how can that play a role in you know, those coaches out there who may or may not you know, feel like they need coaching education? Um, Shellis, we'll start with you. Yeah, coaching education has been a big part of my life, not only taking courses. Um, when I started off as a young coach, I coached the way I was coached. I think that was the norm. And the modern coach today have to be able to sell their ideas. And, and yelling don't get you very far today. So, so players get turned off. Time has changed. Um, and, and so you have to have good information and modern information. Um, T today's game is changing so quickly, and I'm very anxious to see the technical report that comes out of FIFA on the most recent changes in the World Cup. And, and so we, as coaches, we're no longer trapped in the way we used to play, okay? Uh, and what I mean by that is many of us coach the way we were coached or have the same philosophies of what our coach gave us. So coaching education gives us an opportunity to expand our knowledge, to be uh, involved with other people in the game that sees the game maybe a little bit differently or they're educators and they're going to make you a better coach. You know, if they can make me a better coach, then I can make my players better players. And that's the key to coaching education. I have enjoyed my, my years with the NSEA and I also work with the uh, U.S. Soccer 
uh, in their courses. I've enjoyed it tremendously. I was just recently asked, well, what are you doing now? I said, I'm, I'm doing as many coaching education courses as I can because I have to stay sharp and I have to be able to give the most recent events that's going on today to help the coaches become better. Ian, um, same question. Sure. Well, um, I don't think the fact that I've watched a lot of law and order makes me qualified to be a lawyer um, any more than having <laughs> A lot of ER makes me qualified to be a surgeon. So having just watched a lot of soccer um, doesn't therefore make you a coach or an expert. So formal coach education, which I've had through the English FA, uh, US soccer and the NSCAA, is the cornerstone, I would say, of my professional background. And I would also say that if there's anybody out there who's choosing to make a living in the game or being compensated for their time, which I believe they have a right to be compensated, they should uh, have gone out and got themselves their formal coaching education, uh, whether it be in the US system or UEFA or CONMEBOL or somewhere else. I think, I think it's fraudulent to take money from parents and, and clubs and colleges without having put yourself through formal coach education. Um, by the same token, a lot of my background is based on having been to the NSCA convention. Um, sitting in on uh, international trips, most recently to Europe for the World Cup uh, with the Belgium and the French Federation and Anderlecht and Ajax. And so consequently, there's the formal education, which gets you the certificate, the badge, you're evaluated. But I think there's a lot to be said for the informal, where you're going and observing and uh, intentionally interacting. And then the final one for me is the what I call the informal, which is the most common which is sitting down with a friend over a cup of coffee, over an adult beverage, watching a game, reviewing a game, going watch, uh, watching one of the coaches in your club coach so you can see how somebody else approaches it. So I think it's kind of a three, three cornered stool for me, the formal, uh, the semi-formal and the informal. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big proponent, a big proponent that be it perhaps just once a year or once every couple of years, coaches need to put themselves into a an evaluated uh, coaching diploma, coaching certificate, coaching award type situation. I think it's, uh, I think it's beholding uh, of us as coaches, as professional coaches. Um, kind of maybe a little along those um, lines. Uh, we have a question here from Coach Aaron. Um, how can the internet train? How can internet training and research be combined with standard courses offered by organizations such as the NSCAA? offer a deeper, more comprehensive curriculum um, than, is, than is currently offered? Ian, you want to take that one? Yeah, Aaron, it's a great question and thank you for asking it. Um, some three years ago when I was interviewed for this position, we talked about uh, e-learning and so on and so forth. And I said at the time, and I will stand by this, that there's no substitute um, to being on the field, getting grass on your cleats or synthetic grass on your cleats and being in that uh, in-person interaction with your colleagues and with the instructors. Um, I don't think there's any substitute for the in-person learning on a residential or non-residential setting. However, um, as a supplement, as a preparation, um, as a top-up, a review, what we have now with things like Google Hangouts, webinars, um, certain applications that have all kinds of content on there uh, with video, I believe these are an essential part of the coaching education tool now. And so an informed association, which I think the NSCA is, um, is trying to provide a lot more platforms for coaches such as yourself and your colleagues um, to learn from. And uh, certainly the webinars, uh, we've embedded in animation in those, we're going to have video in them. Those have been very popular. Um, and then of course you can take um, some awards now uh, the English FA particularly has some great psychology awards that you can take and uh, and generate your own award uh, by doing everything remotely. Um, but this notion of on-demand I think is the key. So a lot more of our coaches now can reach information on-demand as opposed to having to go to a fixed site uh, as the traditional model used to be. So I think it's a great time to be a young coach because I think there's a lot of resources out there for you. Uh, Shalos, uh, we have a question tweeted in from um, David Clark. How important um, is it that the personality of a coach comes through when delivering sessions? 
You know, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think it's extremely important. When you're doing a session, I, we've all seen uh, uh, the presenter work the session and not really engage with the players. It's, it's all about the session. And I think your personality of being caring, uh, have some empathy to the mistakes, being able to uh, laugh at yourself, but also to make fun of something, I think may, puts everybody in more into a relaxed environment. It, it's the same qualities that you need when you're coaching your own team. And, and I think um, uh, players today want that relationship. It's interesting how players will go through a wall for you if they believe in you. And then there's some players that will want you to open a door for them uh, because they don't, they don't believe in, in what you're saying or they don't feel connected to you. So I think the personality is, is a big part of it. You know, as coaches, we wear, we wear three different hats. We, we select the team. We select the players we want. We select the system of play. Uh, we're also wearing, wearing a, a hat where we basically are, are managing the team. You know, we have to, unfortunately, have to do some discipline if players are going out of line and we have to be able to say, no, you're not going to play this weekend or this is not the way we want it done it within our club and our standards. And then, then we coach the teams. We try to take them and make them better physically, technically, tactically, and work with them psychologically. But I think the personality today is probably the greatest magnet for players. If players want to play for you, they will play for you. If they don't want to play for you, they won't play for you. Interesting. Okay, um, well, so uh, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but let's um, kind of dive into the symposium, which um, begins next week. It's the 31st through the 3rd in Orlando, Florida. So, Shellis, will you give us a quick overview of what you'll be presenting um, at yeah, the symposium? Yeah, of course. Um, symposium? Uh, I'm really excited to, to be invited into the symposium. Um, I will be doing uh, the defensive play, uh, the principles of play, uh, with exercises that are involved in, in pressuring the ball, and the exercises, as, as Ian mentioned earlier, will start off in small numbers. And it will be just grid play and to teach players how to pressure, how to get close to the ball, what is a close distance, what is the wrong distance, how to force players on angles and try to force them out of bounds and, and lose possession. Um, when you put pressure on the ball, you limit time and you limit space for the opposition which stops them from the penetration. And then I'll go into uh, 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 a pressuring the ball, but now pressuring it in longer spaces or bigger spaces and how you must have uh, restraints so that you're not diving in for tackles or being called for fouls. Uh, and then of course, protecting a goal. How do you pressure the ball and protecting on goal? With having a teammate behind you like a goalkeeper that was giving you information. So communication then will be a big part of it. Then we move into the next phase, which would be support. And we would go through that same process in a, in a grid. And then going into with numbers, maybe an exercise with two goals, going into numbers where uh, players are, are stopping uh, the players from penetrating and then also marking players at 2v1 or making sure that they're marking runners. And then we'll go to another exercise, again, the small numbers, three against three, uh, in stopping um, with plays or changing the point of attack. And now we're going to be dealing with balance. And those numbers will be going up higher as, as the game continues to get more and more numbers in the field. And we'll continue to add numbers. And maybe 5v3, where it's a little bit easier for the opposition to change the point of attack. But working with the three as a group, OK? Uh, and having those three be able to communicate, pressure the ball, support the ball, and then also to bring the balance. And then we're going to higher numbers again to, for concentration. And when you look at your concentration, you may look at it as a back four and how those players work together. There's going to be pressure on the ball, there's going to be support, there's going to be balance just within that back four. And then your midfield line, uh, how close are they to the back four or how close are the back four to the midfield line to bring the concentration. And then we hope that... Um, at the end of the session, we can put it all together and play a 9v9 or 11v11 game, depending on our space, 
so that we can now talk about all those uh, those little points that we brought out in those in the grid play. Yeah. Sounds very comprehensive. I'm look, we're looking forward to it, that's for sure. Ian, would you give us a quick uh, rundown of your um, session at the symposium? Yeah, well, um, I actually have the responsibility of sort of um, overview of all the sessions. So um, we're going to offer um, material for coaches coaching U6 through U10, um, and that's going to be a track. We're also going to offer sessions, uh, much like the one Shellis described, classroom and field for coaches who want to um, explore and investigate the principles of play. And then we're also going to have a track for coaches working with high school age kids. And certainly the principles of play would be valuable to them and those, those sessions combine. Um, but there's three tracks there. And then there's additional content in the mental skills uh, area, which is obviously a very big uh, booming sort of industry around the game right now is psychology and team building, motivation, etc., dealing with adversity. And then we have some guests who are um, involved with uh, health and wellness and recovery, uh, clearly, uh, importantly, uh, rec um, injury prevention. And unfortunately, if injuries occur, then injury care. So there's quite a lot of offerings in a relatively short period of time. Um, but I'm most excited to work with uh, Shellis and the Krupa guys on the principles of play and um, my colleagues with US Youth Soccer and Florida Youth Soccer particularly on the U6 through U10 curriculum. And so I'll be sort of flitting back and forth with all of those. Okay, great. Um, I think that's all the um, time we have for um, questions um, today. Um, thank you both Ian and Shellis for taking the time to um, share your insight with us today. Um, viewers, if you're watching this on nsca.com slash live, um, you can register for the symposium and the register now button right below this player. Um, we have a ton of information waiting for you um, next week in Orlando, Florida. Um, um, Ian briefly mentioned um, diploma tracks. Uh, we have several of those um, being offered. Field sessions, lecture sessions, uh, lots of information galore. So please so um, make sure to register today. Um, you can also save a few bucks if you register online rather than waiting until um, on site. Uh, again, if you have any quest further questions, I believe Ian is on Twitter. Um, you can follow him at Barker and SCAA. And then if Shellis, um, uh, if you have questions for Shellis, you can also um, just tweet them to us and we'll make sure to um, get those to him so he can answer them. Again, thank you for tuning in and looking forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Monique. Yeah. Thank you, Shellis. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Yep, my pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.